Hi, I'm Nick Dalio, and I wanted to thank you for joining us right here at Bayside Chapel Online. Our prayer is that today's service is a blessing to you, that it will encourage you in your journey with Christ, and that it will help you see and understand all that God has in store for you. We would love to hear from you on how God is using this ministry to bless you, and we would love the opportunity to pray for you. You could send us an email at amen at baysidechapel.org. Remember that you can stay in touch with us anytime by downloading our app. Just visit the App Store and search for Bayside Chapel of NJ. Also, if God is using this ministry to impact your life, then we want to give you the opportunity to partner with us financially. Simply go online to BaysideChapel.org or use the Bayside Chapel app, then choose the giving option that works best for you. Enjoy today's message. Well, it's that day we express appreciation for moms and for the amazing work they do in our lives, and especially to give thanks for those, those women who brought us into the world, who gave birth to us and dedicated themselves to nurturing us. I gotta believe that being a mom has gotta be one of the hardest jobs in the world, and it certainly can be the most exasperating of jobs at times. Uh, nothing probably contributes more to a mom's exasperation than, than three of the most hated words in the English language. And maybe you've heard them before, Mom. We need the sound, guys. Travels with time. It never has time to do the yard work, coaches the soccer team, or fixes the house. But everybody else's husband has time. My little sister got an iPod touch before I did. It's not there! When I finally find time, watch my favorite TV show. Sorry if I traumatized you this morning, moms, with that chorus of kids shouting, it's not fair. Have you ever heard that before? Uh, you know, there may be a few things more exasperating than trying so hard to be a good mom and you basically, you know, are giving your life to the welfare of this kid only to have them accuse you of being unfair. Uh, and not to depress you young moms too much on Mother's Day, but it only gets worse as your kids get older. <laughs> I like what one experienced mom has to say on the subject. She writes, when I first became a parent, I tended to ponder the question and ask myself whether or not my pronouncement or judgment that evoked this expression really was fair. Then I got old and lost my patience. My youthful ones, as they grew into teenagers, became more skillful at arguing every point, no matter how trivial, no matter that they could have accomplished whatever I had asked in a fraction of the time it took for the argument that ensued. The good news is that all this practice at argument could someday prove useful to my children if they should become lawyers, con artists, or newspaper reporters. <laughs> However, to trot out a cliche, age has its privileges. And one of the nice things about being a really old mom is you can just ignore all the rules and do whatever you want. When Curly Girl utters those fateful words, that's not fair because you don't treat my brother like that, I no longer ponder the question. I just ask her if she's a 16-year-old boy who runs track and plays football. And if the answer is no, then I guess she's not identical to her brother, so I don't have to treat them exactly the same. I repeat the sentence an hour later when her brother comes to complain about how I constantly favor him over or her, favor his sister over him. Then there are the times they both come at me complaining of unfair treatment at the same time. I keep waiting for Buddy the Wonder Dog to chime in too, griping maybe he doesn't get walked as much as the pooch next door. Nowadays I have the same answer, the one that my parents used to give me, only now it doesn't irritate me so much. Not fair? 
Well, life isn't fair. Get over it. <laughs> I've discovered with glee that it's a lot more fun to say those lines than to hear them. And I expect someday to hear them again, coming out of my kids' mouths. There are a few things more exasperating as a mom than to be accused of being unfair. So uh, if your mom is still alive and you're going to see her today or you're going to call her on the telephone, you might want to apologize for all those times as a kid that you accused her of being unfair. And if you've ever been accused of being unfair as a parent, can you imagine how many times a day God must hear it? Because people are accusing him all the time of being unfair. Well, is God unfair? Uh, that's the, the question that we're examining today. Uh, in our passage for the morning, Romans chapter 9, verses 19 through 29, as we discussed uh, last week, Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 are where Paul comes to God's defense, especially regarding his dealings with Israel. Because in the first century, many more Gentiles were coming to faith in Christ than Jews, and it was beginning to look like God was going back on his promises to his chosen people. And Paul answered that, look, there is Israel, the nation, but not all of Israel is chosen. There is within Israel a true Israel, those who are truly chosen by God, and it's always been that way. It was never a matter of religious heritage or family ties or personal merit. It always and only has ever been a matter of God's sovereign choice. He hardens who he hardens and he has mercy on whom he has mercy. That's where we ended in verse 18 last week. And we pick up this week right where we left off and immediately the complaining begins. Look at verse 19 where it says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Look, if I'm spiritually hard because God in his sovereignty has hardened me and not chosen me for salvation, then how can he hold me responsible for my unbelief and rebellion? God doesn't choose me and then he punishes me for my sin? That's not fair. A modern day kind of version of this would be like saying, God, it's your fault the way I am. You can't hold me responsible. I mean, after all, you made me this way with this addictive personality of mine. You're the one who gave me these sexual urges I can't control. Or it's no wonder I can't control my anger with this crazy family you put me in. And then you blame me for the things I do? That's not fair. I find it interesting that Paul chooses not to argue the point. He never gets tied up in that old controversy about where the sovereignty of God ends and the free will of man begins. In the book of Romans, he affirms two things that seem to contradict each other, but they're both true. On the one hand, he affirms that a person can only be saved by God's sovereign choice when God draws him to faith in Christ. It's the only way. And then on the other hand, he also says that each person is wholly responsible for whether they choose to trust Christ as Savior and Lord. Both are true. Now, no one will ever satisfactorily explain how God gives us free will and remains in sovereign control at the same time. It's beyond our understanding how all that works. I mean, if we understood everything about how God works, he wouldn't be much of a God, would he? That's why he's God and we're not. So rather than arguing with his objector or trying to explain what is beyond human comprehension, Paul chooses instead to rebuke the spirit of the question in verse 19. How is it fair that God finds fault with me when he in his sovereignty has made me this way, when he hasn't chosen me? And Paul, sensing insolence in the very question, roars back in verse 20 and says, but who are you, and the emphasis is on you, who are you, oh man, to answer back to God? We see here, uh, you know, a contrast between man and God. He's pointing out the arrogance of a puny man who would dare accuse the God of the universe of injustice. This is worse than a toddler who says that's not fair to a, a mother who birthed her and has devoted her life to providing for her every need. Now, Paul illustrates how ridiculous this is to accuse God of injustice in the rest of verses 20 and 21, where at the end of verse 21, he says, will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? He's saying, imagine a piece of pottery that a potter has just finished making. And, and the potter you know, kind of 
wags a finger in the potter's face, or the pot, the little vessel, wags a finger in the potter's face and says, hey, potter, why'd you make me like this? You, you should have made me better. You should have made me different. You should have made me, you know, more glorious. He says in verse 21, has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Isn't it the potter's right to take that, that big pile of clay and grab one lump and put it on his wheel and, and make a beautiful vase out of it? And, and isn't it his right then to take from that same lump of clay another hunk of clay, put it on his wheel, and make a you know, very utilitarian bowl out of it? When I was in college, I studied for a summer in Israel, and we went to a potter's house in the city of Hebron, you know, kind of just like the potter's house in the book of Jeremiah. And, you know, as potters have done for centuries, here was this guy, uh, you know, making clay pots on his potter's wheel. And uh, some of those pots were, you know, or some of the, the things that he made were beautiful, delicate vessels that he would glaze in richly uh, ornamented kind of glazes and beautiful colors. And uh, they would end up on the top shelf of his shop. <clears throat> and then there were other pots that he made that were very utilitarian, you know, just basic clay pots for carrying stuff or, or for, you know, taking out the trash or chamber pots. You know, they're, they are just very utilitarian, kind of very common pots. And, and that's what he's talking about. It's the potter's right to make some vessels for honorable use and other vessels for dishonorable use. God has an absolute right to do with us whatever he wants. No matter what he does with us, we, we could never ever be in a position to talk back to God and accuse him of being unfair. And, and this is kind of like coming to the get used to it part of the, of the passage. That's just the way it is. And yet, there, there's a turning point here because having established that God has an absolute unquestionable right to do with us whatever he wants, Paul goes on to say, yeah, but then God treats us far better than we deserve. God treats us far better than we deserve. The amazing thing is that a just and holy God chooses to deal with so many of us in mercy and grace. The wonder is not that God condemns sinful rebels, but that he chooses to save so many of them. And so in this passage, Paul shows us there, there are at least two surprising ways that God treats us far better than we deserve. And the first is found in verses 22 through 26, where he's showing us that God is gracious to some who are farthest away. He treats us far better than we deserve. He is gracious to some who are farthest away. Now, you know what grace is. Grace is when we receive a gift that we don't deserve. When you receive the gift of salvation, that's grace. Well, Paul tells us that God's timetable for history is more concerned with dispensing grace than it is with dispensing justice. You know, we clamor for justice. We say, God, you're not fair. We want justice and we want it now. And God says, uh-uh, no, 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 wait, wait. It's better for you that the execution of my justice wait a bit so that I can first extend some grace. Paul says in verse 22, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. God is very willing to show wrath against the unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth about him in their wickedness. But, but Paul is saying here, look, he puts up with them for a time. These vessels of wrath, these pieces of pottery for dishonorable use that come off his potter's wheel, their, their condition is better suited for destruction than for being put on a museum shelf. Who could argue with God if he would just let them have it? God is not reticent to let them feel his wrath. In fact, his justice demands it. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 7, it says, He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Wherever God sees sin, he must punish sin. And yet, Paul says that this God, who is so zealous for righteousness, so ready to punish sin, chooses to wait. Why? Well, we have part of the answer there in verse 22. He's endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory. God knows that his, when his judgment comes and all has been said and done, there will be no doubt about the power of his wrath against sin. But if he judges sin now, 
Who, who of us would remain? If he judged sin right now, we wouldn't have an opportunity to observe the glory of his mercy and grace. God could have wiped out the whole human race long ago. But the universe would only have known him as a God of justice and wrath. It would never have come to know him for the God of mercy and love that he is. And so he puts up with the whole sinful human race for a time so that in the lives of some we might see his amazing grace displayed. He puts up with those right for judgment so he can show mercy to those he has chosen and prepare them by his sovereign will to receive glory rather than condemnation. That's grace. All of us by rights should be vessels ripe for destruction, but he prepares some for a better, more glorious outcome. The whole race deserves judgment, but the wonder of it all is that God puts off destruction for now so that by his grace he might save some. And who can argue with that? The wonder is not that he doesn't save us all, but that he chooses to save any. And what's even more amazing is that he chooses to save some who are the farthest from him. Now, it should be no surprise that God would choose some of the Jews for salvation. After all, they were his chosen people. But look who else he's chosen to save by his grace. He says in verse 24, even us whom he has called, believers in Christ, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Even us, those who are believers in Jesus, we are among those who are sovereignly prepared by God in advance for glory rather than wrath. Jews and Gentiles too, and that's the real surprise because God had said to Israel, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. So the Jews figured they were the vessels of honor, all of them. And, and the Gentiles could only ever be vessels fit for wrath. But amazingly, God says, no, I choose some from the nation of Israel, and I choose some who are Gentiles too. Gentiles too are becoming recipients of God's grace. And that's the amazing thing. Now, Paul quotes the prophet Hosea to show that there's historical precedent for God to do something like this. In Hosea's day, the people of Israel had become so rebellious toward God, so unfaithful in their idolatry, worshiping other gods, that God, essentially in Hosea, gives them their divorce papers and says, you are lo ruama, you are not my people, you are lo ami, you are not loved anymore. And, and he basically cuts Israel loose but then, in the, in the prophecy of, of uh, Hosea, Hosea prophesies that in his grace, he will take back these people who had strayed so far from him. He quotes from Hosea, beginning in verse 25. As indeed, he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her, her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Hosea is talking about how God would take back rebellious Israelites. Now Paul is applying this teaching from Hosea to the present situation. In essence, Paul is saying, look, God's doing it all over again, except this time for Gentiles, for those who are farthest from God. He is calling Gentiles my people. He is calling those who are not loved my beloved, here he has taken some of those who are enemies of God, who are far from him, and he has loved them in Christ with an everlasting love. He has taken those who don't belong to God and has adopted them as sons. And so you can clench your fists and say to God like a spoiled toddler, that's not fair. But in light of what Paul has just explained, you'd look pretty ridiculous saying that to God. Exactly how unfair is it that God in his justice should have long ago destroyed us all but has chosen instead to delay his judgment? How unfair is it that in his grace he has gone so far as to spare our sinful race so that in time he might prepare some of us for glory? Oh, and, and not just Jews, but Gentiles too. Those who are farthest away from him. God's not fair, you say? Are you kidding? God is better than fair. He's gracious. He's gracious. He's gracious even to some who are farthest away. Let me give you an example. Who could be farthest away from God than a foul-mouthed, meth-addicted, 
uh, guitarist with a heavy metal uh, band like Korn. His, his name was Brian Head Welch. He was about as far away from God as you could get. But God used a Christian realtor who was showing him houses, and he spoke into Brian's life and said, man, you just seem to be weary of life. Do you know that God says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest? And that got his attention, and, and the realtor invited this foul-mouthed, meth-addicted rock star to come to church with him, and he did. Brian Head Welch went to an average church like this. He heard the gospel message, and he gave his life to Christ, and his life was totally transformed. Well, Brian Head Welch was here for Netflix a few years ago with his band Love and Death, sharing with students the, the change that Christ had brought about in his life. And I want you to watch just this very brief segment uh, from Brian Head Welch's I Am Second video. My dream came true way more than I dreamt about. I, got, I made more money, I played bigger shows, I mean, houses, cars, I tried drugs, I tried sex, I tried everything to try to get pleasure out of this life. And I thought that I could fulfill my life with all this stuff by, by having my dream come true, and it came true, but it didn't fulfill it. When Christ came in, that feeling, He gives you the gift of understanding life, which is everything was created for Christ and by Him, and we're created to be with Him. And it's the most incredible feeling because you're where you belong. And contentment is given to you in life because you don't have to look anywhere else. And you're exactly where you need to be. And the question about life is answered. I'm Brian Head Welch, and I'm second. Does anyone still want to insist that God's not fair? I mean, come on, the reality is that God treats us far better than we deserve. God is gracious to some who are farthest away, like, like Brian Head Welch, like many of us. And, and more than that, Paul goes on secondly to say, here, here's another reason, uh, another way that God is, it treats us far better than we deserve. Not only is God gracious to some who are farthest away, but God is merciful to many who are at their very worst. He is merciful to many who are at their worst. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is God withholding from us what we do deserve, namely judgment. There's a story about the Emperor Napoleon. One day a mother came to him asking him to pardon her son who was going to be executed. The mother asked the ruler to issue the pardon, but Napoleon pointed out that this was his second offense and that justice demanded death. To which the mother responded, I didn't ask for justice, I plead for mercy. Napoleon said, but your son doesn't deserve mercy. To which the mother responded, sir, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is all I ask. The son was granted the pardon. When you are spared a judgment that you deserve, you've been shown mercy. Paul quotes from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah next to remind us of a time when Israel deserved God's judgment. After generations of idolatry and unfaithfulness to the Lord, God sends the prophet Isaiah to announce to the people of Judah that a day is coming, a day of judgment is coming, when the land will be laid desolate and they will be taken to exile in Babylon. And, and much of Isaiah's prophecy has to do with documenting the sins of the nation, showing how bad things had gotten, how much they deserved what was coming, how they were at their very worst. Verses 27 and 28 of our chapter speak of of that judgment that will be thorough and quick. Paul writes, and Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant will be saved, for the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. In fact, the devastation they have earned is compared in verse 29 to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and like Gomorrah. 
The judgment that is coming is well-deserved. The nation is straying farther and farther from the Lord. There have been plenty of other occasions when God would have been justified in bringing his judgment on, on the nation of Israel down through the centuries. In the wilderness, for instance, when God told them, go in and possess the land, and they refused. Or during the days of the judges, when everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Or during the days of the kings, when so often they chose to worship Baal and Moloch instead of the Lord. And what was happening in Isaiah's time was just the latest episode when God would have been justified in wiping out the whole nation. And, and he says, this time I'm going to do it. They were at their very worst and they had it coming. But even as judgment is about to fall, God chooses to be merciful by preserving a remnant. Judgment is the dark backdrop against which the jewel of God's mercy shines brightly. And, and amid Isaiah's predictions of utter destruction, there is this ray of hope. Look at verse 27 again, where he says, And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant will be saved. Only a remnant, but at least a remnant. Judgment is coming, but a remnant will be saved. That's mercy. Some will be spared. They'll go into exile for a time, but God will bring them back to the land, and again he will bless them. He will be their God, and they will be his people, and he will fulfill his covenant promises to them. Utter destruction is coming, but it will be different from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in at least one respect. Look again at verse 29. If the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Except for the, the Lot and his two daughters who escaped, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were totally wiped out. In fact, to this very day, archaeologists aren't exactly sure where those cities were. They were so thoroughly destroyed. Israel and Judah were quickly reaching that point. They were at their worst where their rebellion against God was concerned. They deserved what Sodom and Gomorrah got. But again, God would show mercy. He would not wipe them out completely. He would leave a remnant, offspring, who would be heirs of God's promise to make Abraham's offspring into a mighty nation through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, how is this relevant to the situation of Paul's day? Well, again, Paul is saying, look, the pattern's repeating itself. Israel as a whole is again turning its back on God. Not just on God's word, not just on God's prophets, but this time on God's Messiah. This is why in verse two of our chapters we saw last week, he speaks of being grieved for his people. It's why he, he'll say at the beginning of chapter 10 that his heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they be saved. It's in, why in chapter 11 he speaks of how God in the present time is again choosing a remnant of his chosen people who will believe in Jesus. As a matter of fact, in just 13 years from the time that Paul wrote his letter to the Romans, the armies of Rome would, would invade Israel, utterly destroy Jerusalem, level it completely, destroy the temple, and scatter the Jewish population across the face of the earth. Judgment was coming again. But through it all, a believing remnant has been preserved down to this very day. Time and time again, when Israel was at its worst, God chose to be merciful to some. Now, in fairness, God should take us, sinful rebels all, and give us the Sodom and Gomorrah treatment. But God is better than that. He's better than fair. He's better than just. He's merciful. When many of us were at our very worst, he showed us mercy. And so, should we accuse God of being unfair? Is it unfair of a potter to make whatever he wants out of a lump of clay? No, that's his right. Is God unfair? No. In fact, God treats us far better than we deserve. He is gracious to some who are farthest away. And he is merciful to many who are at their very worst. If you're far from God today, Take comfort in the fact that God is withholding judgment and extending to you the offer of salvation by his grace. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. But the Bible also says, don't put it off because today is the day of salvation. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Today is the opportunity that you have to respond to the good news of Christ and trust him for the forgiveness of your sins. You may be afraid that you've gone too far. 
for God to accept you after all you've done. But the good news is that he is merciful even to those who are at their worst, if only they'll repent of their sins and put their faith and trust in Christ. And if you already know Christ as your Savior, you know, make sure you don't get all full of yourself and think somehow you, you deserved it. Because all you can do is give thanks for the fact that God chose to save you by his mercy and his grace. Give thanks that though you were at your worst, though you were far from God and undeserving, God sent his son to die for your sins and came looking for you. I love a story uh, by David Slagle. He's from Georgia. And he writes, being from the South, I love ribs. I remember hearing about this particular restaurant that had amazing ribs. And a bunch of my friends and I drove 50 minutes to get there. The place was packed and the food was great. It was all you can eat rib night. And rib bones were piling up as fast as the line to get in. Now eating ribs is messy business. Barbecue sauce gets on your face, your fingers and clothes. Dirty napkins pile up next to half-eaten bowls of baked beans and coleslaw. When our crew had eaten all we could eat, we paid our tab and waddled out to the car. That's when I reached into my pocket for my keys and came up with nothing but lint. Starting to panic, I looked through the window at the ignition. I was hoping that I'd lock my keys in the car because in the back of my mind, a more disgusting possibility was taking shape. When I saw that the ignition was empty, I knew exactly where my car keys were. The keys to my car, my house, and my office. Only seconds earlier, those precious keys had slid right off my tray and followed a half-eaten corn cob and several bones to the bottom of a trash can. I had thrown away my keys on all-you-can-eat rib night. It was a long walk home, and my friends certainly weren't going to help me do the, or weren't going to do the dirty work for me, so I dove in. I fished through the bones, the beans, the barbecue, the corn, the cake, the coleslaw, and a host of saliva-soaked napkins. A shiny layer of trash can slime had coated my arms before I finally grasped hold of those precious keys. He talks about reflecting on this incident, thinking about how Jesus came to earth on a mission to save us. And he goes on to say, I think about our dumpster-diving God I mean no disrespect by calling him that. On the contrary, I have soaring adoration for the infinite God who left a pristine, sinless heaven to search through the filth and rubbish of this fallen world for something precious to him, me. Is anyone else here today thankful for a dumpster diving God who treats us far better than we deserve? Let's praise him today for his mercy. Let's give thanks for his amazing grace. Mm -hmm.